In this video, I'm going to show you the results uh, when analyzing frequency content with a simple Fourier transform, a power spectral density, and this aggregate FFT method, which kind of combines the two. And what's best, what method is best for which different uh, type, for different types of input data and what you're trying to get out. And I'll use some simulated data to start, and then I'll do a long duration uh, test uh, and, and analyze that as well. This is part of a four-part series uh, on analyzing, uh, doing frequency analysis of vibration data. So if you want to dive deeper into how to calculate power spectral density, how to calculate these aggregate FFTs, I encourage you to do that and subscribe to our channel to check those videos out. So I'm going to be using our open source library to analyze the data. I won't spend too much time on the code uh, in this video, but I encourage you to dive deep at, at your leisure to, to use these, these functions. Uh, on your own data sets. <clears throat> and it's open, it's free, pip install NDAC. I'm installing the development branch uh, to get some uh, newer features, but you know, it's, it's a nice open source library to use on any data sets. So I'm gonna start by generating three signals, noise from 10 Hertz to 50 Hertz, uh, two sine dwells or sine tones I've added on top of one another, one at 30 Hertz and one at 80.25 and then sign on random. So I've added those two together. First, this is the first thing people do uh, when they get data is they plot it in the time domain, which makes sense, but you can't tell any information, any frequency content by looking at a time domain. Even these, even the, the, <clears throat> the signal that has the two sign tones, that's pretty hard to see when looking at it in the time range, time domain. So I'll start here by Comparing uh, a few different Fourier transforms, I'm using one of the functions in our library, FFT.RFFT, which is real FFT, so it returns just the real results. <clears throat> uh, and all I did is I passed in the acceleration data, and it, it returned the Fourier transform. And so I'll get into this a bit more <clears throat> when I compare the results to the other ones. But the one thing I want to really call out is, you know, when I do the whole time range from 0 to 10 seconds, I have this nice flat line for the uh, random because I, I generated that random off an inverse FFT. But those two sine dwells, I would have thought, or sine tones, for whatever reason, um, well, I know the reason, but the one that's at 30 hertz, I get exactly with my FFT. It sees me this one, it shows me this 1G peak. Uh, and it's, you can see it's just a perfect triangle. It's just 1G at that. And then it, at 29.9 hertz at zero, but that 30.25 uh, sine tone has a peak here of 0.64 Gs, and that's because there is some leakage into the other uh, frequency ranges. So that's an issue that you know the full time range looks has a different value than when I do zero to what's a good example? Just zero to one seconds. Now it's a little different where my 80.25 hertz peak is actually higher than my 30 hertz peak. So this should be alarming you a little bit that the, the value of the FFT, the, the peak amplitude is really dependent on the time duration, your frequency bins and how well it aligns with the actual underlying data. The other thing we'll get into as we compare the other results is that the random content will change based upon the time. We'll show that later. Here's the results using a power spectral density. Uh, the nice thing here, the power spectral density, is these peaks. So I plot the you know, from just zero to two seconds, and if I add the zero to eight point three seconds, it's exactly on top of each other. Zero to nine seconds, zero to ten seconds. So those peak amplitudes are now independent of the time range, which is really really powerful. Uh, the other benefit is the the values and the random content become independent of not just the time range, but also the frequency bin width we use because it's a density and it's random vibration. So it spans across a lot of different frequency content. So as you widen the, the bin width, you just get a smoother result, but it's still the same value, 0.02-ish, uh, regardless if you are doing a, a thinner bin <clears throat> or a longer or shorter time range. The problem though with the PSD here is you're seeing is that the peak uh, amplitude isn't G's as my input data and it's a density. So as my bin width gets wider, the value comes down because it's less dense because it's in this wider frequency range. 
So then we introduced this aggregate FFT method, which uses the power spectral density calculation methodology, which is basically segmenting a file um, and then computing a bunch of FFTs and averaging them together. And so by doing that, I now have some of the benefits of the PSD where from zero, the zero to two seconds is the same result as zero to 8.3, as zero to nine, as zero to 10. My peaks are also more what I expect. So I'm expecting to see something at, at 30 hertz at 1G, and that's spot on. And at uh, 80.25 hertz and at 1G, <clears throat> I don't quite get exactly there because my frequency bin doesn't perfectly align. So at 80 hertz isn't exactly 80.25. And that's why I have a kind of this curved um, uh, lead up into my, my peak. It's not a perfect triangle. It means that that frequency content kind of spilled into the other ranges next to it. But I'm seeing something of what I expect. The problem, though, you'll see here is the random content is now changing. The values are changing as the bin width changes because it's the density. Uh, so if I have a wider, it's not a density rather. So as I have a wider range, um, and I'm not normalizing to my bin width, I have more energy in that wider range. So it's really good for individual sign tones, but not so good when we're looking at random. <clears throat> so here, you don't have to look at the code, but I generated, uh, I compared the FFT directly to this aggregate FFT method compared to the power spectral density for a few different time ranges, as well as a few different bin widths. So here's the FFT, and, and let me just try to focus on, just do the, the zero to 10 seconds, and I'll compare that to the aggregate FFT here, which shows me something, oh, that's, here we go. This is the aggregate FFT for a two hertz bin, where I'm round 1G for my 80.25, it's at 80 hertz, that's about right. Um, whereas when I had to rely purely on the, the spacing of the Fourier transform, uh, I, I get a result that's much lower than what I'd expect. If I lower the, if I tighten my um, bin width like I did here, I get a lower result. But you see this kind of, it's, it's basically flat because I have 80.5 hertz and 80.0 hertz, and the frequency tone is exactly at 80.25. So it, it's, basically an equal energy in, in both or kind of half in both. So there's that. And I'm going to dive a bit deeper into this for a longer recording, which now let me pull up here. Um, but again, the big takeaway, though, is the aggregate FFT does a better job than the just pure FFT that is dependent on the input data range, data length uh, at, at capturing the, the amplitude of what you'd expect. So now I'm getting some longer data where this is a prototype of ours where we subjected it to a mil standard 810 uh, profile for a aircraft and we tested it for an hour. So I, I took that data in and then I added to it a sign tones on top of one at 30 hertz and one at 80.25 again, and I plotted it. And you can see in the time range, you can't tell much difference. This is you know really spread out. So I plotted here now just a, a second or so worth. You can't tell much difference between the random data and then the red line is the random plus the sign tones. They're not significant enough to really change the values all that much. But uh, and that another reminder that the frequency, uh, the time domain uh, can't tell you a whole heck of a lot, but it's a good first step. So now let's look at the frequency domain using a power spectral density. Again, using our function psd.welch, really easy. Just pass in the acceleration data, and I get, and I specify the bin width, and now are these two lines. So here's, here's that the data we subjected. This is matches the mil standard A10 uh, profile, and then the sign dwell on top of that. And this is really nice. I, I'm basically matching the, um, you know, the mil standard A10, and then you see these peaks now at those those frequencies that we had put in. But the values aren't necessarily what I expect, and so we'd get, we want to compare now the results of analyzing this with the PSD at different bin widths and different times, as well as with the FFT and the aggregate FFT. So I did that here, and I generated this plot. I'm going to pull it up in this other window uh, here so you can see it. <clears throat> Hopefully you can see this. So here's 
the results. I did a couple different FFTs of just, and again, when I'm doing a typical uh, FFT, I can't necessarily uh, specify the bin width. You can kind of indirectly by maybe specifying the the, the length of your FFT, uh, but it's it's pretty beholden to the length of the input data. And so when I do just the one second um, versus the 10 seconds, it's quite a lot different. It's very messy is a big takeaway. I can't really take much out of this because my bin widths are so tight. As my time range gets longer and my bin widths get finer, I'm, I'm now even plotting just shaded bars because it's so much data. Uh, it's not worth trying to plot at all. You notice a couple things. One is, is there's just really not much to, to glean from this. Maybe you can tell in this, you can't tell in this, I guess, that like there's something going on at these frequencies, which is important. And you can tell, you can see rough shape of the random, but the 3000 seconds versus the 600 seconds, there's an order of magnitude difference, or at least an order of two difference in kind of the values that you're getting out. So it's not really all that good at quantifying this. So now let's look at my aggregate FFT method. And here I'll just start by maybe looking at, uh, and you can play around with this for a little bit of time. So here's the 10 seconds and do, do, do. there, there we go. So 10 seconds at one Hertz bin, it's a little messy, but you can see my sign tones at one G at, at 30 Hertz, one G at 80 Hertz and one G at 300 Hertz, although it's not perfect. As I lengthen my time, let's see if this gets a little better. It does. Uh, and then what did I do? Did I actually make that 30 hertz? Did I make it 300? I forget what I made it. Da, da, da. I made it 300.5. So I, I purposely put it halfway between uh, my bins to make it an egregious difference. And so you notice my 1G peak isn't exactly that for the 300.5 hertz sign. Uh, tone because it had to span across a few different ranges as i lengthen my time this gets a little cleaner you see that which is nice but the big problem is as if i change my bin width here my values are also changing dramatically because it's not normalized to the bin width so this aggregate fft does a really nice job of giving you a clean output and and giving you values that are are correct for the this, you know, discrete sign tones, but they don't do as good a job for random. So now let's look at the PSD here, the one second, it's kind of messy, but if we lengthen our time, we start to get a really clean result. And we go 10 seconds, it's cleaner. If we go up to 60 seconds. Here's the 60 seconds, you know, it's a really nice, starting to get really good. Here's the one Hertz versus eight Hertz. So this is a wider bin, um, you know, it starts, I'll get into that in a second. And then there's a 600 seconds, really clean. But now if I have too wide of a bin, which I'm showing here, you can you can barely even tell that there's a peak here at, at, uh, at 30 Hertz. Even when I do the really long recording, you know, it's, it matches, it basically matches the 600 seconds, which is good. But this is something that I, I really want to emphasize is that the PSD, because it's this density, it can mask, uh, and I'll just I'll just show these. When I'm looking at a uh, sine tone uh, on top of the PSD, it can really be masked by the density, especially if my bin width is really really wide relative to where the sine tone lives. Now, in the real world, most sine tones are going to move a little bit, which will help you in the power spectrum density because it's gonna it's not going to be at a very specific frequency. It'll probably shift a little bit with time and temperature and and, and drive frequency and, and things like that. But big takeaway here is the aggregate FFT does a nice job at, at cleaning up the results of a just simple Fourier transform. It does a nice job to allow you to explicitly define your frequency bin. Uh, and it does a really good job at, at giving you the peak sine tones at values you'd expect, but it's it doesn't do as good a job for random because it's been it's not normalized to its density. So comparing one recording to another with different uh, bin widths will sh give you different results for the random content. Whereas the PSD will give you really good results for the random content independent of frequency and bin width, but uh, it can start to mask 
sine tones if your bin width gets too wide uh, relative to where that sine tone lives. So what's the answer? Uh, typically, you want to have, uh, here, I'm coming back. If you're doing frequency analysis, I recommend doing the power spectral density first. It's the easiest thing to do. It's generally the best and uh, for vibration analysis. If you notice some, you know, not a really clean kind of flat um, uh, output in, in frequency ranges and a lot of spikiness, it might be worth doing a aggregate FFT to just with a, a thinner bin, which you can also do just in the PSC, just kind of thin, uh, reduce your bin size a bit to see is there is there a sine tone somewhere, and um, and you may end up needing to do the power spectral density to kind of get the random content and quantify the signal more broadly, and then maybe the aggregate FFT to kind of give you explicitly where that that sine tone is and, and the value of the uh, the sine tone the amplitude of it. With that, uh, again subscribe. There's going to be another video on analyzing uh, data that has varying frequency content over time. So check that out and, and please subscribe uh, to, to, to receive notifications of more videos on fruit vibration and shock data analysis. Thanks.